Sustainable development around the world. Their mission is huge, but we're breaking it down in two minutes. 17 sustainable development goals. Let's get to them, because the more you know. Look, in some corners of the world today, people are living on a dollar a day. Hey, that's not how it ought to be. So go one, eliminate poverty. And go two, root out hunger across the globe. There's 800 million people hungry if you want to know. Number three is health and well-being. And getting people the health care that they need in. Learning in school are the harder go for. Education opens up minds and doors. Goal number five is empower girls and women so they can have the same rights that men are given. Number six, people need water that's clean. Poor sanitation can't spread disease. Carbon free energy is goal number seven. And how to achieve it is a question that's pressing. But if we put our minds together and work hard, we can find a solution. I'm guessing. Development goals to improve life all around the globe. Protecting human health and the environment. Whatever bed we make, we gon' have a lion. 17 sustainable development goals to improve life all around the globe. Protecting human health and the environment. Whatever bed we make, we gon' have a lion. Now imagine that you work all day for no pay. Economic growth to decent workers go eight. Goal number nine is to foster innovation and in infrastructure and industrialization. Goal number 10, inequality reduction. 11 is sustainable city construction. 12, well, that's sustainable consumption. So what we use matches up with production. Goal 13 calls for urgent action to combat climate change because we know it's happening. 14, protect life under seas. 15, protect life on land. Goal 16 is for peace and justice all over the planet. They're in high demand And the final goal Number 17 Is the critical factor The heart of the machine Is to strengthen the way We achieve these goals Of sustainable development Around the globe Yo. 17 sustainable development goals To improve life All around the globe Protecting human health And the environment Whatever bed we make We gon' have the lion 17 sustainable development goals To improve life All around the globe Protecting human health Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you are in the world. And uh, welcome to our second skill based master classes of the 2021 UNAI Youth Bootcamp. Today, we are very delighted to have Yang Lu, Sunny, uh, who is the CEO of VeChain, which is a blockchain uh, platform. Sunny served as a um, IT exec uh, executive in Fortune 500 companies, and he was the former CIO of Louis Vuitton China. With uh, a solid technical background, he has accumulated effective experience in the information system and technology strategy and management. So today he will be sharing with us some of his career experience and technology analysis uh, experiences. So without further ado, let's give the stage to Mr. Lu Sunny. Hello everyone. So I'm gonna share my uh, slides here. <clears throat> All right, um, so um, yes, thank you for the introduction. Uh, very glad to be here. Uh, my name is Sunny. Um, I started VeChain since 2015 as a blockchain startup. Uh, we have been focused on uh, enterprise level applications using uh, multiple different technologies like a blockchain, IoT, um, and the accessories. Um, so before we talk about today's uh, topic, it's about how blockchain can help carbon neutrality or how blockchain can uh, bring the unique feature and value to the carbon neutrality implementation. Uh, before that, I just wanted to share a little bit my experiences. Uh, hope to give you guys some uh, references or if, if it can be an uh, inspiration, I will be very, very happy about that. Um, so I get to know about um, 
blockchain since 2013. Actually, today is quite a, quite a unique day, a very special, uh, because yesterday, you know, um, Bitcoin ETF has been approved by SEC eventually. Um, the reason this day is very special because, uh, you know, uh, the first ETF application was submit like eight years ago in 2013. Actually, that, that was how I get into um, uh, this, this uh, topic or get to into this territory. Um, at that day, as uh, you know, I was still working at Louis Vuitton uh, China, and um, I, I had this kind of chance, you know, um, to look at the Bitcoin from this kind of news. Um, I was uh, impressed by this news. You know, the Bitcoin was uh, Bitcoin ETF was uh, submit for um, for approval, uh, even though it took like uh, eight years. Uh, eventually, got approval by yesterday, but. Um, that was a quite fun, very fun journey. Um, actually, by then I was, um, you know, after this, I, I, I spent some time to study about what blockchain is or how blockchain works. Um, and then, you know, in 2015, um, I made a decision, very, very tough decision uh, to quit my previous job and, you know, devote myself into this territory um, totally. Uh, the reason I did that actually is, um, well, there are several other reasons, but um, I would say one is, uh, you know, the curiosity of bone in my DNA, I guess, you know, it's kind of uh, pushed me to the new things always. And um, secondly, I find myself, I, or, you know, since 2013 to 15, before I made the decision, I already um, play something in the territory, meeting with the people around the world, uh, actually, thanks to uh, Louis Vuitton, because I had the chance to travel around the world, so I'm able to, you know, use my some free time to meet the different people, um, different blockchain um, communities around the world. And during the process, I find a very interesting thing. You know, the entire blockchain space is full of, let's say, um, words, full of, um, you know, technical guys, even the gigs. Uh, funny story is when I was traveling to um, uh, San Francisco, I was in um, uh, NASDAQ Center for a, a blockchain summit. Some of the engineer, um, you know, random guy, I, I didn't even catch up the name, sorry for that. But uh, he was telling me like, I, I have done like very cool blockchain application. So he just uh, showed me his codes. Uh, you know, he didn't show me any kind of demo or, or, or um, uh, even the dummy application or the interface, how it works, but he just showed me the codes directly. <laughs> so um, back by then, you know, the, the industry was full of technical guys and, you know, people are thinking about the technicians or uh, technologies or solutions or even the codings directly. So I was, uh, I was, I, I find now, you know, uh, it, it was my shot, it was my opportunity. Because if this technology is really, let's say cutting edge or promising to the future, even can be called as next to the internet, um, it must generate some value to the real business. So um, it's kind of like we need not only about the technology mindset, but also the business mindset. Um, and when I was in Louis Vuitton, that was my job, you know, as, acting as a bridge between business and technology. Either you find any good things about technology, could you know, uh, find a find a scenario use case could uh, uh, bring the new value to uh, to business, or uh, you 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 can identify some issues or challenges from the business and bring some technology to address that. So um, I, I think that's my, definitely that's my opportunity. So I, I made such decision and quit the job and, and start, start the, you know, uh, to do the uh, blockchain startup since 2015 um, until today, okay? Um, so let's go to, the, uh, go to the blockchain and the carbon neutrality. Um, okay. That. Okay, so firstly, um, introduction, a little bit introduction about the blockchain technology, uh, even though, you know, blockchain has been born since 2009, uh, actually January 3rd of 2009, 
it was the first uh, data block of Bitcoin. And actually the white paper about Bitcoin was uh, done in October of 2008, uh, exactly like uh, 13 years ago now. Um, but um, I, I'm not sure how many people are you are having a technology background, a computer science background, or really understand uh, how blockchain works or what blockchain is. So I'm using a very simple way to try to introduce to you what blockchain is. So uh, let's get to a very interesting story. Um, imagine you with your loved ones saying, you know, uh, consider if you're a guy and you have a, you have been with uh, um, uh, the loved ones and you say, I love you to a girl with nobody else can witness or can back up your story. And this kind of scenario we, we can call, it's kind of like a central system. Unfortunately, if you know the guy regret what what he uh, could say, uh, you know, uh, no one could back up the story, right? Um, people are just um, uh, that the guy could regret um, and can say something like, "I never say that." I could have lied about that. So that's called centralized system because uh, it's on, the data only exists in one server, or one node, and anyone who control the server can easily change the data. So that's for a centralized system, that kind of concept. But imagine you are with your best friend with your loved ones. And during that kind of the scenario, you say, I love you to a girl. Um, it's kind of like, kind of like oaths. And uh, if you want to change later on, you know, you don't need to, you, not only you, you got to regret by yourself, but also you need to convince your best friend to back up your story, help you lie about that. So it's called a centralized system with a backup. Uh, it's more reliable um, other than the centralized system, but still, if you are able to, you know, uh, manage the since, uh, primary server and also the backup server, you still can change the data quite easily, right? So you can see the data can be easy to change. That's the uh, kind of vulnerability about the current central system or centralized system with backup, these kind of two scenarios. So give another Im imagination. If you are standing in the street, whatever in Beijing, Shanghai, New York, or uh, Paris, um, or Milan, whatever, in a random street, and you are saying, I love you, or giving an oath to somebody else uh, in front of hundreds of random people. And for sure, you don't know those hundreds of random witness. So they all hear what you said. And if you wanted to regret, I'm not saying it's impossible, but let's say it's very difficult. You got to connect her to those hundred random people and try to convince them or even bribe them, you know, they lie for you, right? So that's a very difficult because those data, your oath has been existing in the random uh, hundreds or even thousands of different um, people's mind. And they, they all hear about this thing. They all have identical data, right? So that, that is, it is the blockchain. Um, so it's very difficult to change. I'm not saying like impossible, but we'll say 99.999% uh, of chance the data cannot be changed. So that's, that brings the blockchain a very unique feature with the data immutable to change. Um, so back to a little bit technical, um, you know, how it works, um, I, I'm not going to go through this process to you, it's a little bit technical, but look at the, you know, the second part or like um, of, of these slides, you can see actually the blockchain is a very special database. So every time, every, uh, let's say, define a time, either 10 minutes for Bitcoin or 10 seconds for VeChain, let's say, you know, um, every time window, uh, there will be a data block will be gen generated and then contains a specific data in this time window, happening in this time, right? And with the timestamps uh, sealed this kind of the time block. And also there will be a chain or we call hash pointer uh, in terms of the computer science technology, we call hash pointer acting as a chain to point to the last block. So if you think about this way, the entire blockchain networks, it's a special data format and acting like a data, a data block and chain 
connecting to the last data block and chain and last, you know, going to the last again. So the entire database format, it looks like data block, chain, data block, chain, block, chain. Then that's how the name comes from. So it's a very direct name to describe a very special database and that's it, okay? Um, so forget about those technology. Those are a little bit boring how it works. Um, blockchain consider as the future technology as like even people say it could be an internet 2.0 or could be the next version of the internet. Uh, to try to give or elaborate, you know, how big about the blockchain technology could be, or how, let's say, um, the what is the influence to people's life in the future. So I list a little bit about, um, you know, how blockchain works and how internet evolves in the past, so we can see the history actually repeated itself all the time. So which is very good to somebody like us, you know as a startup, as a player in this territory, we have a reference to refer to and we can learn from the history and I try to think about, you know, for the future, for sure, with the innovations as well. So for example, the first stage, usually we talk about the technical protocols, uh, even in the internet, you know, um, I don't know how many, um, I, I, I'm sure you guys are young, but back to uh, 40 or even uh, 35 years ago, maybe, um, you know, there was a different protocols um, betting, betting each other, uh, battling each other, try to win, like try, try to win out, like to be the protocol to uh, carry out the entire internet. I remember when I studied about the network, there was an ATM protocol. Oh, it's not money machine from the bank. That's another one. Um, it's ATM protocol and also TCP IP. Even the ATM protocol was like kind of having a technical edges or technical advantages, but eventually TCP IP won, 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 you know, won out. So for blockchain, the same. Blockchain also going through this kind of phase with different technical uh, protocols, even the technical protocols could be evolving as well. So we consider this kind of the period is we call technical consensus period which means uh, different people, different technical guys, different technical team projects or platforms. They are also try to build up the different protocols, but under let's say similar technical framework. So we call this is a technical consensus pro, uh, period. Okay. And going further from internet, from the protocol, then go to the very revolutionary products like a browser, email, uh, really, you know, open up people's eyes and, and leading the people to the, uh, to the new era. So for blockchain is the same, uh, starting from the Bitcoin, you know, consider as like a decentralized ledger system, we call DLT. So it's a distributed ledger technology, we call DLT. All the smart contracts coming from, um, you know, Ethereum, that kind of the uh, platform. Um, so those kind of two consider the products is very, very, let's say uh, revolutionary. It really changed people's life in the future, I believe so. Um, so um, going further, um, if we continue to talk to you uh, about the internet, well, I saw uh, some of uh, people are raising up their hands, maybe asking the questions, uh, but uh, let's, let's I, I will take about like 45 minutes and go through uh, what I'm going to share with you first and answer the questions uh, you know, together, okay? Um, so uh, going further from the revolutionary products, um, now we're going to, let's say a very, very critical moment or very critical period is called struggling business models, right? Even we know Explorer email, this kind of product is, is revolutionary. It really changed everything. Um, but actually even today, you barely can find business model out of browser or email and most likely just for free use. I, I don't know if any one of you remember there was a company called Netscape. Um, they are selling browser as a software product to people back to let's say 1980 something or 1990 something. Um, but for sure Netscape now is long gone. Um, every day today everyone using the Explorer or email basically for free, right? So that means even the revolutionary product 
may not be able to lead to a successful business model. Uh, so that's a challenge part. So uh, during this kind of period, you know, um, lots of different players are trying and 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 try to create or, or put the different trials and try the different models and try to make money with uh, try different products. But you know, it, it kind of goes through the hitting a wall for sure. For most of the new technologies, it goes through the same phase. So that's the internet bubble we have been experienced in the in the in the in the past, um, and and then you know with years and years developments and further evolution of technology, uh, then we have more and more uh, great products of great service on board. Uh, for example, like cloud and computing, uh, different three G, four G, five G to support the mobile. And, uh, and then leading to, you know, um, interesting business model like e-commerce, like social media, um, even a short video right now, very, very hot um, things. And those evolution um, of technology and generating the different products eventually lead uh, to great companies like Google, Amazon, Alibaba, Tencent, even themselves are, are you know, are evolving themselves uh, from day by day, year by year. For example, when Google start, um, you know, search engine, uh, they they just wanted to provide a very convenient tool to people who try to search the information, um, you know, on the internet, right? But eventually, Google never imagined. I, I'm sure Google never imagined they become the most, uh, the biggest commercial company in the world by using these kind of the technologies. I think the same thing to Alibaba, to Tencent, even to TikTok. Um, you know, those giants, internet giants, they're go through in these kind of phases as well. So back to the blockchain, actually, um, I'm sure, even, even though I, I put in some green words here, um, the, the whole blockchain space will go in through these kind of the phases as well. Even like uh, business models, uh, struggling business models are, are right now, it's, it's ongoing. Um, but if, if blockchain technology needs to be like the internet, I would say there will be much more uh, great products or great services or infrastructures needs to continue to improve for sure. Okay, so that's, that's kind of our mission for any startup, any players in this territory. Um, and also, you know, uh, we all know COVID-19 is kind of changed lots of uh, everything, changed many things. Uh, but um, I would say one of the one of the new uh, let, let's say one of the trend is um, everybody just to realize digital digitalization is something we should do yesterday, not today or tomorrow. We should we should get it done long long time ago. So we're able to you know go through this kind of the uh, difficult situation. Today is COVID. I don't I don't know for the future could be some other challenges to the humankind, but. You know, digitalization is definitely, um, uh, you know, aspect for anyone, whatever it's enterprise or, or any case, even individuals, whatever big corporation or small startup should be able to, you know, uh, go through this with digitalization. So also during the past couple of years, we can see any enterprise, you know, when they have uh, digitalization or well, they start digitalization earlier, and they can go through this kind of tough time uh, much easier than others. And when we talk about the digitalization, we will talk about more things like without um, people's presence, uh, even like today, I'm giving you guys a, a presentation through uh, online. Actually, I'm, I'm just arrived in Geneva today. Um, you know, those kind of the remote collaboration or people don't see each other. People are not able to, you know, sit in the same room, uh, watch uh, people, you know, look at the people by talking um, and feel the vibes in the in the room, something like that. You can feel like this kind of remote collaboration, even even you don't show your face, but you, you just wanted to do some uh, quickly uh, collaboration. The trust becomes very, very important. And blockchain with the name is called Trust the Machine is the powerful tool to uh, to you know, enable digitalization everywhere with lower costs of trust, you know, open collaboration, incentive mechanism, in-time incentive mechanism for, uh, 
that kind of an ecosystem play. Okay, so I, I know recently lots of people are talking about the metaverse. You know, metaverse is just a, a, let's say a, another way, or or maybe three or four steps ahead for the current situation. How people could uh, remotely connecting to the world, uh, remotely connecting to each other, and you know, play the new collaboration in a more, in a digital world. And blockchain definitely can solve lots of issues, a lot of challenges to make this happen. So consider blockchain has been considered as one of the fundamental technology uh, to um, either current digitalization or the future metaverse. Okay. So um, what to do with uh, carbon neutrality? Actually, you know, blockchain can uh, address lots of challenges or lots of issues uh, with a unique feature like publicity, trust, transparency, and immutable data, immutable activity, that kind of the features. Um, and even, uh, you know, VeChain has been starting to do enterprise level applications since 2016. And we accumulated, accumulated like almost a hundred cases in multiple different sectors, like supply chain management, um, sustainable fashion, um, um, carbon emission as well, uh, food safety, uh, pharmaceutical industries, healthcare, uh, even we have a couple of applications to help different areas uh, to fight against the COVID-19 as well. But to be honest, I, I think, I believe actually, um, you know, carbon neutrality is, uh, or let's say, uh, ecosystem-like uh, application will be the fine, you know, the, the promising direction for blockchain uh, developments. And a carbon neutrality is just one of them. Um, so before we go go to like how blockchain can help that, I just wanted to give you guys a um, quick uh, brief why carbon neutrality now is very important. I'm sure you know better than me, you know, um, it sits in the number 13 SDG, uh, climate change. And basically, um, other than those, you know, national policy or, or government, you know, directions like 3060 uh, national plan in China or everywhere, almost everywhere. Um, we uh, honestly, personally, I can I can feel the impacts coming from the climate change, especially this year. Uh, we see the flooding situation in uh, Henan, Zhengzhou, China. Uh, we saw the news from uh, Germany. Um, and also even the New York has been experiencing some uh, flooding situation as well. So that kind of the climate change, you know, becomes more and more often, uh, more and more severe, let's say, to us. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's not just, um, you know, it's just not, not just like a promotion to the market or, or calling for everyone uh, to, uh, to, to how to support that or how to contribute that. It's more like how we are gonna get the implementation for real to, um, to uh, change the situation. Otherwise, you know, it's really, really gonna, it, it's gonna be really, really tough, not only to us, but also to our, you know, next generations, to our kids and the kids and kids. Okay, so when we talk about the carbon neutrality, I wanted to say normally uh, the following process is about, you know, you first thing you need to know about your carbon footprints, like how much carbon emission you generate for now as, as it is, right? You might, whatever the technology you have been using or whatever the industry you have been using or whatever the products or, or services you have been pro providing to the market, to the public, um, you gotta know how much carbon emission you have emitted, have been generated. So the carbon footprint usually is, you know, the first uh, first step. And then you need to understand, like, um, if I wanted to improve that kind of situation, um, I need a someone, or usually we need a someone to certify or to verify um, these kind of the numbers, right? To so we are able to see the the differences in the later. Uh, we, or the improvements um, after some uh, a new technology, new process has been implemented, okay? Um, and also the, um, you know, um, carbon emission improvements as, you know, uh, when we know what we are going to, uh, what we have done as is, and we know how we're going to, uh, we, we need to figure out the way how to improve uh, either 
you know, uh, for the simple uh, example is instead of driving a fossil car, you could start in with uh, electricity vehicle to save uh, some carbon emissions. Okay, so it's more like a carbon emission uh, improvements. And then uh, it will be like uh, how, when, when more and more, um, you know, implementation has been done, more and more improvements will be done. We can see slowly we can reach to the carbon emission peak. Uh, that's also the China's plan, you know, by 2030, China needs to reach carbon emission peak, which means after 2030, we only can emission less, not more than um, before. So for sure, there were lots of, um, you know, uh, lots of work, lots of efforts, even uh, lots of money needs to in invest in this space. But I want to also give you guys um, a simple uh, fundamental uh, concept. You know, the carbon emission is kind of linked to uh, economic activities of the humankind, right? As long as the, the, the country has been evolved or the economic has been developed or progressing, and naturally carbon emission usually is going up as well. So it's a big, big challenge. Firstly, I believe, you know, China going to continue to develop and continue to grow uh, you know, the economic for sure. But also at the same time, we need to um, find the right way, find the right technology, put them in place. So we're able to reach, um, you know, carbon emission peak. And later on, you know, when we have more and more of these kind of improvements to be to be in place, and we eventually could, we could create, we could reach to a carbon neutrality, which means um, whatever you, uh, your activities or your business or your, even the people's normal life, uh, you know, uh, contribute to the carbon emission could be absorbed eventually uh, by, uh, by the environment. So we can call it carbon neutrality. And for sure, China target is 2060. Okay. But also, we can see um, this kind of activity or this kind of the, um, let's say, uh, even everybody knows about uh, we should care about climate change, we should care about carbon emission, we need to work for the emission reduction. But also, we can see lots of challenges. Uh, simply to say, you know, right now, or in, at least in the past, when people start to think about, oh, I gotta, I gotta uh, protect the environment, uh, protect our planet, um, what you gonna do? Usually you send a bunch of people uh, in the middle of the desert and plant some trees and took a photo, they just say, okay, we already saved the planet, we generate some uh, you know, emission reduction, something like that, or, or contribute to the carbon neutrality. Um, but you know, it's very hard to quantify and also quite hard to incentivize or continue to motivate individuals. But, you know, this kind of the target, like 30, 60 target is very, very challenging. It's no more just, uh, let's say, uh, government efforts or uh, enterprise efforts. It, sh it should be efforts from everyone, okay? It should be efforts from everyone. So we are thinking about, you know, how we can uh, unite every individuals, even individuals, to be incentivized, to be motivated in the real time to contribute, you know, the carbon emission reduction. Um, so we think about the blockchain for sure. Um, imagine, you know, whatever you could do um, to contribute to carbon emission reduction can be digitalized, can be recorded, can be verified and incentivized in time. Then I would say, you know, uh, even the normal people, even they just have a normal mindset, like, okay, I still care about my living, I still care about my life quality, but I also wanted to save the planet somehow. Those kind of people can be even can be motivated, can be incentivized. And the behaviors, normal behaviors uh, can be, you know, grow the day by day. And eventually we can unite everyone's uh, effort to do the contribution to the carbon emission reduction. For example, you know you're gonna you know uh, ditch away your fossil cars by driving the EV instead, uh, or you, you you go to the Starbucks and try to buy a coffee with no more paper cup supplies, but or, or, always carrying your your own mug, and you can wash it later on. So those kind of activities, if can be incentivized. And people will feel more, you know, um, 
motivated to, to do this kind of thing eventually becomes a behavior on a daily basis, right? And also when enterprise try to do that, and you, got, you can see more value, uh, like how to reduce the future, probably future current cost and new branding look, um, you know, um, a public awareness for low carbon efforts, that kind of thing. So it's more like a branding or image, or let's say become the role model to incentivize more people to do that. Uh, whatever the EV brands or, or like what I just mentioned about Starbucks, uh, even a, a, like a fashion uh, recently, sustainable fashion is a new black in Europe for uh, quite a couple of years. And those kind of brands can bring the unique features or unique value uh, to the public as well. So, um, but also, you know, very challenging part, it's not just because enterprise, when they uh, incentivize, somehow incentivize uh, d different individuals or consumers, they also need to be incentivized or you need to be motivated. So we need to have this kind of the close economics, um, you know, like the flows need to be, uh, you know, closed. So everybody are able to, uh, you know, go to this, um, uh, go to this direction, go to this train to, to save the planet with, with everyone's efforts. Um, so eventually, you know, in a, the government or anyone who are optimize the resources uh, could using this kind of way to let's say anyone who is not contributing to SDG or not or have a large carbon emission needs to pay more. So, you know, the low carbon emission uh, could get more motivation or incentivize and then eventually to optimize the resource to, you know, focus on the low carbon activities or invest more to low carbon activities. And further and further, more and more, you know, we are able to reach the 30, 60 uh, planes. And for sure, there will be not only just, um, you know, what I just mentioned, actually, in terms of the carbon uh, emission reduction or the low carbon uh, platform, there were many other applications, um, like, you know, uh, supply chain management as the first step, and also uh, carbon exchange. Uh, every know, everyone know, like in, in Shanghai several months ago, the new uh, environmental change start to uh, exchange, start to support the carbon credits for the whole country. And there will be more and more. Right now, the first batch is just about 2,200 power plants as a players. Uh, they are treating about a quarter from, from the government. But later on, I would say they will have more and more um, different uh, carbon credits could be traded in this kind of exchange, like uh, CCER, like a PCER, even the personal. I, I hope you know it could be get this kind of incentivize that will definitely put more push to um, to the entire society's efforts. Okay, um, so that's in, about the concept. In summary, uh, I would say you know what blockchain is really doing is to um, digitalize. Firstly, digitalize the positive behaviors to either SDG or let's direct it to the carbon um, emission reduction and record to the blockchain so it can be verified, uh, not by human, can be verified automatically and it can be incentivized in time. So, you know, uh, individuals, even a small enterprise entities are able to uh, go in further for this kind of thing. So um, let's show some uh, use case quickly, uh, how VeChain we did for the real case. Um, so firstly is, um, you know, I have to reinforce this because that's very important. Uh, when there is a misunderstanding, let's say in the market, you know, when people think about a blockchain application, uh, they usually try to find a blockchain companies or focus on the blockchain technologies, which I would say um, it's kind of, a, you know, um, not right to do. Because when we think about the blockchain application, the real thing is that's that's a very hard learning in the past of four or five years. We have done, you know, after we have done like a hundred cases, more than hundred cases. Um, actually, when you think about the blockchain application, only 20% of efforts or less than that link to, you know, blockchain itself. But more than 80% of efforts are coming from, or should be focused on like, business integration, the business design, the new case, uh, you know, designing or the value revealing, uh, all of the, let's say, non-crypto part or non-blockchain part, okay? 
So that's that's what VeChain has been doing. We're not only focused on the blockchain part. We want, you know, uh, for example, VeChain Soar blockchain uh, has lots of, um, you know, um, features could enable enterprise to do so. But also very importantly, VeChain, VeChain Soar blockchain is one of the best green blockchain in the world. So that means, you know, um, we have a special consensus, uh, blockchain consensus to unite the networks, which with very limited carbon emission um, from the network itself. Well, if everyone, probably everyone heard about like how Bitcoin, you know, uh, you know, have lots of power, electricity consumption and generating the energy waste to the environment. But actually, you know, there is other technologies like what VeChain has been doing, has been implementing to make the blockchain technology super green and low carbon emission for sure. And our target is to, let's say, um, to make VeChain Soul blockchain as the carbon neutrality blockchain, um, I would say very soon. Um, I just wanted to give you a very, uh, let's say, a very specific number impression. Um, the entire VeChain blockchain, you know, generating the, the, the carbon emission generated by the entire region blockchain for a whole year only represents very small percentage, like 0.002%, something like that of one Bitcoin could be minted or could be generated. So we can see the power of the new technology improvements uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, go green, to go carbon neutrality with that, okay? And how are we gonna do that? So firstly, you gotta, you gotta try to identify the critical data in the process, usually let's say happening in the supply chain. If we wanted to um, focus on some like a product carbon footprints, you need to identify the different supply chain steps, uh, how get this product, you know, from the raw material to design to manufacture until to deliver to uh, consumers' hands. The entire process, you know, has lots of data. And what we need to do is to identify which kind of the data could be linked to the carbon uh, calculation. And then, you know, just based on with uh, experts, uh, carbon experts um, formula or, or let's say um, um, services, consultant services to tell us how you're gonna calculate that based on the different scenarios, uh, different products. So here is one of the, um, one of the use cases we have done with a very big, let's say, or very um, carbon neutrality focus uh, supplier in, in China, it's called Shocky. They using this kind of a, um, you know, special raw material for low carbon footprints and for like recycled materials. So you are able to see like, you know, coming from this uh, raw material, how much carbon you can save or how much carbon uh, you can uh, e emission uh, comparing the others, okay? And also, you know, from the material, you we also need to identify the different process from, uh, you know, uh, knitting process, uh, cutting process, um, uh, you know, even the retail process. So this is an example from a course. Kosa is a fashion brand, uh, very focused on, uh, you know, uh, sustainable fashion. So based on the entire process plus the raw material, we are able to know or identify this product is a recycled product. And also we wanted to make consumers to know when you buy this product, you know, you are contributing uh, to the sustainability, you are contributing to the recycle economics as well. Um, and the second case is very interesting, actually done with Tsinghua University in 2018 um, and with uh, very, uh, one of our partners, DMV. Uh, and BYD, you know, we put, we install a, a blockchain application running on VeChain um, to every car of uh, BYD electricity vehicles, including Qing Pro and Tang, those two type of uh, electricity vehicles to collecting the driving data. So simply to say, you know, this application could collecting like a, a mileage you drive, a, uh, electricity con consumption, battery uh, life cycle data, and also like uh, even you, you sometimes you have to use gas. So based on all of the data, they, was, they will calculate 
how much carbon emission reduction you can you can you can have by driving a hundred kilometers, uh, you know, EVs instead of fossil cars. So um, the the drivers or like the consumers, the the car owners will receive the incentive, you know, in terms of the token to demonstrate how much carbon emission reduction you have saved. Um, and also we connecting to like uh, Bright Food as a retailer company, consumer foods company, and like a PICC as an insurance company to build this kind of the ecosystem. Uh, for example, when you have this kind of incentive, you can go to Bright Food to buy milk with discount or go to PICC to have insurance covered for your car next year with discount as well. So those kind of a real incentive or real let's say economic incentive can really motivate individuals to go for more EVs other than just fossil cars. Um, so from this kind of the use case or like kind of like isolated use case, we're trying to you know group them together and to try to do more. So one of the one of the project big project we have been working that's actually one of the reasons I'm traveling to Europe right now. Uh, to work with uh, San Marino, um, work with the San Marino government. It's a very small country in Europe to try to uh, help them to um, accomplish zero emission state, um, you know, as the first one in, in the world. Well, they, they are, honestly, they are very small, only like 33,000 people living there, but it's a perfect case to do the startup. So imagine uh, to do the application. In, so remember a very key uh, word about a very key point about you know building up so-called ecosystem or big projects whatever you always start from small so i think that's a perfect case or perfect scenario we could, we could connect in uh, different scenarios you know from the previous experiences like uh, ev motivation like uh, charging station um, and like uh, you know the green energy green water uh, clean water, that kind of uh, scenarios can really incentivize different people. Um, so yeah, for, for example, going further um, about the transportation will be the first one, including the bus, bike, um, you know, public transportation, uh, comparing driving a fossil car, individually fossil car, it definitely can save lots of things. So we wanted to create this kind of a ecosystem and involve every citizen in the San Marino to uh, contribute, get motivated, can to contribute to the uh, you know final uh, uh, zero emission state. This is kind of the states of uh, of the of this country. And for sure, we wanted to. Uh, if we succeed here, uh, honestly, I'm like 99% uh, confident we're we're gonna succeed here, and we will start. Uh, we will be able to replicate to the bigger places, bigger cities, uh, bigger countries for sure. Okay, so yes, um, that's all I'm uh, uh, presented. So let's uh, see if there's any uh, Q&A sessions. Uh, okay. Uh, so I received the one question here is, uh, how can blockchain contribute to the governance of metaverse? Okay, so that's a, that's a very interesting one. Um, you know, when we talk about the, even talk about the blockchain itself, uh, blockchain gonna go through uh, three different uh, phases, I would say. Like I mentioned, technical consensus is the first stage. I think we barely pass it after, you know, more than 10 years, uh, the, the blockchain was born. Uh, now we're more focused on the business consensus, like how people can work together, how people can be incentivized or motivated to, you know, collaborate each other. But going further, we need the rules, right? We need, um, uh, let's say, the governance to, um, to, to, in, to, to let's say, to uh, incentivize or reward the positive behavior, but punish the bad behaviors, eventually creating this kind of fear and fear world. So even for blockchain itself, you know, the government governance consensus is, is, is one of the tasks we have to get it, get it down uh, in, the, in the future. Um, to metaverse, actually, the same. Um, so one of the concepts in, um, uh, you know, in uh, in the blockchain is called DAO, decentralized um, autonomous organization. 
You know, the DAO is more like, you know, in the ideal world, DAO is going to using the smart contract, using the blockchain technology to help, um, you know, the entire community or entire world to make the decision. Um, for example, should we upgrade or should we uh, cut the supply for something or should we put more resource on this topic or that topic? So um, I would say this kind of the DAO um, will be more suitable to metaverse because everything happening in metaverse, you know, it's super fast. Imagine you just laying down, you don't, you don't have any kind of a physical constraints or time constraints. Uh, you know, you just need to think instead of a typing or writing to get the message exchange or collaborate with others. It, it will happen in very, very fast. So the, the traditional, let's say, governance model needs to be upgraded and definitely the DAO blockchain can support that, okay? Um, so next question, do you think proof of stake is the ultimate direction all cryptocurrencies will follow in? Honestly, I, I don't believe that because honestly POS is still, still like, um, still in the early stage. Actually, what Vision has been doing is called POA, improve authority. Um, to generating the balance between decentralized and centralized. Uh, I know everybody, when we talk about the crypto, talk about the blockchain, the decentralization is the fundamental concept, the fundamental uh, topic for that. But honestly, um, I think, you know, for quite a long time, or ideally it could, it could be working for decentralization, but in the real world, we need to find the balance between decentralization and the centralization. Right. So, for example, I give an example. Bitcoin um, has been like existing for 13 years, but with those kind of the challenges people are facing, like high transaction cost, or like um, um, you know the block is too small, or time window is too long, uh, it cannot be changed. Why? Because of the decentralized governance. And even though eventually the the so-called decentralization will you know evolve to some kind of centralized part like a mining pool like the nodes and also if you think about the ethereum it's kind of similar situation it could be happening with kind of the ultimate fork like eth and etc that kind of the challenges so um i would say you know the the purely decentralization may not be working and especially during this kind of transition period so what we believe or what I believe is we need to find a balance for decentralization and centralization. The decentralization is for the transparency, for the fairness, and centralization is for the efficiency or for the, you know, um, uh, like uh, speed to evolve. And for sure, this kind of balance with the technology maturity, it could be linked from centralization to de decentralization um, more and more. Uh, you know, carried by machines or carried by uh, smart contracts. But um, we need to have this kind of the balance to have better consensus to support better governance. So far, I think proof of stake is not the answer. Okay. So next one, well, I'm going to jump a little bit because I think you ask for several different questions. Um, so how can we encourage more technology company to be environmentally aware of the carbon emission? Well, that's a very good answer. That's what we just, uh, uh, you know, explained. Uh, so actually before there are several different ways, okay? Either like the UNDP have, uh, let's say, ground or incentivized program, but it's quite slow. You gotta, you know, review the application and put the incentive uh, with the certification, for example, recently, uh, right now, you can see in the world, there is so-called the green bonds or green finance to use that kind of way to incentivize different enterprises, okay? And secondly, um, I would say we, the, the technology company, even they could holding large of servers running or large of, you know, data uh, hostings, computing powers uh, to, for their business, but uh, if they are able to somehow to, let's say, donate or you know, sponsor more to um, carbon emission uh, 
let's say activities done by even individuals done by the others that will be like resource allocation or resource optimization that kind of way um so and plus third you know the technology could evolve itself as well uh, lower energy consumption or better consensus or better technology implementation uh, could drive the uh, you know the environmental uh, with the low carbon emission uh, more and more so I, I only say I believe blockchain is going to be um, um, uh, very important in this kind of uh, uh, in this kind of the use cases uh, actually I can give you a very quickly about uh, one example what we did in Europe um, you know, we we'll work with DMV and the RISI uh, to launch a blockchain-based application for uh, ocean plastic collection, uh, ocean plastic waste collection program to, you know, connecting the, the, the fishman or connecting to the boat owner to, um, to the sponsors directly. So before, you know, if any enterprise say, okay, I'm going to, are gonna sponsor or gonna contribute to a clean water initiative. Usually, they need to find the people, you know, go to the go to the different places and collecting the waste, something like that, right? But now we announce this kind of program. We incentivize uh, individuals to collect the plastic waste directly from the ocean and measure them, verify them, you know, give them the incentive directly with tokens. And then later on, when the tokens pile up, me meaning the work has been piled up to a certain level, the different enterprise can just jump in to say, okay, I'm gonna buy those proof of work with a million dollars to support those guys. And those guys will be incentivized immediately after that with you know, how much they can, um, they can incentivize. So this kind of the fragmented, uh, digitalized and in-time incentiv incentivized you know, behavior can be connecting to the sponsor directly. This will be the way. I, I honestly, I believe that that's going to be the way to unite more and more sponsors, more and more enterprises. Even they could, you know, from from their own business, they could have uh, quite a large uh, carbon emission. But eventually, you know, they could uh, sponsor more to find the balance. Okay. Um, the next question is how could you please share some cases of the combined application of AI and blockchain for sustainable development is if there is any. Um, actually, there is some like what I just mentioned, uh, you know it's just the first step uh, about whatever the carbon emission reduction for with BYD or even uh, directed to the battery control uh, or the recent project what I just mentioned in, in, in the Europe. You know, the um, the next step will to have the AI to analyze um, those data instead of you know the the simple program with human efforts involved. Um, especially, there will be I would say the blockchain data could uh, could really bring the unique value to AI because they don't need to process those data can be trusted. They don't need to uh, process large quantity of of data or the blockchain data, because it can be trusted, could bring more ways to the algorithm or, or for whatever, whatever the data analysis algorithm. Okay, so next question is um, uh, Ethereum, sorry, uh, Ethereum has dApps and one could build a ERC20 token on top of it. Do you recommend this model for smaller parties to participate in a more mature blockchain. Um, well, if you don't care about the cost, uh, honestly, sure, ERC20 is easy. It's got a large of developers, but also you could, uh, you know, facing some of the challenges, for example, the, the that gas cost right now, if you try to, um, you know, sending like $5 on Ethereum, you might paying like two or three as a, as a gas cost. And when somebody, uh, you know, encounter in some uh, congesting time, that could be even worse. And it's not really friendly to let's say normal people like more cost. I give an example, one of my friends in the US, he's newbies, you know, he's from traditional finance, he's newbies. He tried to buy a $7 uh, kind of NFT on the ECRM, but unluckily he was encountered 
in some of, uh, let's say, um, the congestion period. And the apps he was using, you know, with the default settings automatically pushed him to pay like $1,200 for the gas fees. So he buys something, he basically, you know, uh, try to implement a seven dollars transaction, but pay like twelve hundred dollars as a gas fees, which is really not friendly. This is just one of the examples. Um, I would say when you think about uh, building up some platforms or building up some um, uh, applications, especially when you try to work with enterprises, you know, you gotta think from enterprise point of view. Uh, for like, uh, you need to have a predictable uh, under, un, you know like related, uh, let's say lower cost to generate the transactions for the long run. And also, you know, um, you, you need to think about as a professional enterprise or professional, um, you know, business mindset to think about that. You cannot just say, okay, it's easy to build up ERC 20, so I do it, right? So I, let me ask you back a question, name one enterprise has done a production uh, application has been running, let's say two years or three years on ECRM, I would say no, right? There will be must a reason for that. Um, so let's let's go more three more questions, okay? Uh, this is quite long. Um, the presentation is really cool and thank you for sharing, blah, 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 blah. One small question. I'm curious about how the SDGs researchers could gain the access to the open database generated by the blockchain technologies and applied it to the academic research in the future to maximize the efficiency. Why validity, validity as well as the positive influence on the social change? Well, that would say it's, it's gonna be naturally uh, evolves as the natural demands later on. But I would say right now, there are still very few, very, very few, we just get started, you know, very few of these kind of the SDGs or blockchain enhanced SDG data has been collected. For example, the receive projects we just talked about in Europe, starting from like several months ago, we just collect uh, around um, 600,000 kgs waste, uh, plastic waste from the ocean. And it's just one ocean, one beach. Actually, it could be expanded to more. But given a year, for sure, you know, when we have more and more of these kind of activities, more and more uh, different scenarios around the whole world, you know, this kind of data will definitely be, uh, be useful, be valuable for this kind of research and even evolves more uh, programs, more valuable programs, more efficient programs. Um, honestly, uh, I'm doing this kind of platform with my partners, but I will not stop, you know, to put more and more, more and more efforts to create these kind of scenarios and also I would you know, seriously try to convince my partners together to make this kind of the data to be, let's say, uh, easy access or even free use for these kind of researchers, because that's the only way to, uh, to go bigger and bigger and eventually everyone can unite efforts to uh, save the planet together. Okay, uh, last two, do you think the application of the blockchain has a privacy risk? If there is, how to solve this problem? Okay, so actually that's a big debate. Um, I just give you an example, concrete example we have done with San Marino is creating COVID-19 green pass for San Marino, okay? So usually people will consider like, wow, well, there is a, uh, privacy information has been attached to this kind of QR code. Uh, how are we going to prevent? Actually, to be honest, uh, I travel in France, Italy. Unfortunately, they are using normal QR code. When people scan it, you can get most of the information very easily. I know it's against the GDPR, but you know that's the kind of like a special uh, countermeasure for COVID-19 during the special time. However, what we did in San Marino using the blockchain technology solve this problem like perfect way. Because what we do is we, um, let's say the personal data or private data can be hashed and stored on the blockchain for verification. So which means you can verify if the data is right or not, other than revealing the data itself. So it's kind of like zero knowledge proof, uh, that kind of a concept. 
So I would say the blockchain technology is perfect for this kind of situation. And we started in San Marino and Cyprus uh, already. Uh, so let's go to the last question. Um, public people, how to use blockchain in daily life? Would it like a credit card to record details? or like an app to show everyone's details. <laughs> uh, not exactly. Um, actually, uh, we have done lots of blockchain applications in the past. For example, we have done food safety platform for Walmart China. So if you go to Walmart in China, um, in any kind of stores, uh, you, know, you can find like meat, mushrooms, uh, vegetables, and some food with a so-called food safety QR code and you, you, can, you can get the product information and you can enjoy the blockchain benefits without knowing the existence of the VeChain blockchain there, right? Or you, for example, like what I just showed, you can go to the course to buy a recycled, uh, very nice sustainable fashion t-shirt and you, know, uh, you can get all of the information um, secured by the blockchain. Uh, you contribute into the SDG, but you, you, if you don't, you, you don't even know the existence of the blockchain technology. So simply to say, blockchain technology is like infrastructure technology, okay? It, just like you're using internet every day. You're using TikTok, you're using WeChat, you're using e-commerce platform, you're using emails. Even we're talking today, you know, go through this kind of Zoom, but you don't need to understand or you don't feel, you don't see what a TCP IP is or how TCP IP works, right? So maybe the, the, the metaphor is not really right, but it's close enough. So blockchain is like infrastructure technology. You will enjoy on a daily basis. Actually, you could enjoy today, but you, know, you don't stay, you don't touch it, okay? So I, I think it's already like seven minutes over our plan. Uh, uh, thank you everyone for that. I just hand over to, uh, uh, to the host then. Yes, thank you so much, Sunny. This has been a very awarding lecture for all of us and the questions you answered, I'm, they're truly enlightening. Uh, please, everyone, uh, let's give a um, e random applause to Mr. Sunny. And this lecture will also be available for you to review or watch later on our UNAI website. On our website, you can also watch all of the UNAI former uh, master classes at your free time. So again, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Liu. And uh, we hope to uh, hear your lectures again in the future. Sure, thank you very much, bye.
要平衡的期望，生活被温暖拥抱，因为爱是种力量，生命绽放出光芒。那些曾经的伤痛，让这暖从此走远。你和我要大声唱，二零三零的展望，想传达一个呼吸，蓝色海洋的命运。不同面孔在一起，不怕面对风和雨，一起雪上。